Welcome to Film Forum Presents, a podcast featuring special live events recorded at our theater located at 209 West Houston Street in downtown Manhattan. In this episode, Film Forum presents an introduction by the renowned translator Michael F. Moore on April 3rd, 2019, opening night of the U.S. theatrical premiere of Francesco Rossi's complete, uncut, Christ Stopped at Eboli. Mr. Moore created an all-new translation and subtitles for the unseen four-part version of Rossi's film, now playing through Thursday, April 18th. There are no plans to release it on home video or streaming. Introducing the podcast is Bruce Goldstein, Film Forum's director of repertory programming and founder of Rialto Pictures, who ended a long quest to find the uncut version and also edited the new subtitles. Francesco Rossi's Christ Stopped at Eboli was made for Italian television in 1979 as a four-part miniseries. When it was first released theatrically here in 1980, it was retitled Eboli, which actually makes no sense, and cut nearly in half to two hours. In 1982, when I was at the Thalia Theater on 95th Street, we were able to get hold of Rossi's complete version, but ran it for only two nights. That print was screened a handful of times in a few places in the early 80s, and then it just seemed to disappear off the face of the earth. When I began Rialto Pictures in 1998, Rossi's uncut masterpiece was one of the films at the top of my list. But Rai, the Italian television company that co-produced it, had no record of the four-part version in their inventory. It was only last year we discovered that the complete negative was in the possession of Cristaldi films. The late Franco Cristaldi was one of the original producers. Earlier this year, a restoration was completed. We then asked Michael F. Moore, one of the leading American translators of Italian literature, to create an all-new translation and subtitles. Michael is now completing his new translation of the 19th century classic The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni. His most recent translations include The Drowned and the Saved by Primo Levi, Agostino by Alberto Moravia, and The Animal Gazer by Edgardo Franzosini. Michael has been an interpreter for Italy's most celebrated film directors, including Francesco Rossi, and also teaches literary translation at Columbia University. And for Rialto, he created subtitles for De Sica's Il Boom and Visconti's Senso. The uncut Christ Stopped at Eboli, which the New York Times has called an event, will be at film form through April 18. There are no plans for a home video or streaming release. Here now is Michael F. Moore's introduction to Film Forum's opening night screening on Wednesday, April 3rd, 2019. He talks not only about the translation and historical background, but also about the region of Basilicata, where Christ Stopped at Eboli is set. You'll find the slides he refers to on Film Forum's YouTube channel. Thank you for that introduction. I think there's this illusion that translators like to be invisible, and I'm glad that you're sort of dispelling people of that. (laughs) Uh, When I told people that I was doing the subtitles uh, for this film, so many people said, uh, to my surprise, uh, maybe not really, that Christ Stopped at Eboli had a deeply personal meaning for them. Um, For me, it was the first book that I read when I, in Italian, I think, when I moved to Italy in 1975. It had been recommended to me, and it gives this very striking portrait of a part of Italy that I've actually never been to. But I think uh, I've been very struck by uh, the Italian-Americans I know and by Southern Italians and their response to this, which I think is even more personal, because this part of Italy and uh, its poverty and the percentage of immigration has for too long been treated as a source of shame by Italy, by the Italian official historians, uh, is something that uh, should be sort of written out of history. And I think that Italian Americans and Southern Italians have felt this on their skin very deeply. I lived in the North, uh, but in the 1970s, they used to use the word immigranti, immigrants, for people that had migrated to Northern Italy for work. Now instead, of course, the uh, target has shifted even further south when people talk about migration. And, uh, you know, I I always say that I wish people would see this and sort of look at history and maybe recognize that we're all migrants. 
The other aspect, um, when Levy was writing this book, Carlo Levy, um, who was the first Levy that I was aware of, actually, he sees the peasants, uh, which who also Mussolini also saw as a great source of shame, instead as a sort of quintessence of the Italian character. And when uh, at the end of his book, after he's uh, concluded the memoir and he's trying to draw some conclusion about what course uh, the next Italian government should take, he points to the need for a peasant revolution. We have some slides, but before looking at them, I'd just like to mention a few things about Levy. Um, he was sentenced to uh, internal exile, a term difficult to translate, uh, internato, because if I say intern, everyone will think that he was making photocopies. Um, but he was a founding member of Giustizia e Libertà in Turin, uh, which also included one of the Fratelli Roselli. You might know of, of some of the founders of this movement being murdered by fascist thugs through the film uh, The Conformist. Uh, he was sentenced to internal exile to this uh, part of Italy, which we'll see in a map very shortly, and was imprisoned multiple times, actually. After he was freed, he went to Paris, came back, was imprisoned in Florence, um, during actually a very dangerous period in Italy to be not only an anti-fascist but to be a Jew, which is after 1943 when the Mussolini government fell and the Nazis took over most of northern Europe is when the most horrible deportations happen. Uh, there's an interesting joining here, though, of book and uh, film in that Francesco Rosi had long wanted to make this film. Um, and uh, Carlo Levi was very reluctant to give up the rights to it. He, uh, I can see how close it was to Rosi. So it wasn't actually until uh, Levi had died that the rights became available through his daughter and that Rosi made this film. And it's very consistent, even though film historians don't always see that, but it's very much in a line with his continued interrogation of southern Italy, uh, most famously in Salvatore Giuliano and Hands Over the City, where he's looking at corruption very much. And here instead he reaches sort of further back and again at peasant life. And it's a very personal film for him as well. He had just lost his daughter. And there's a somewhat sort of somber um, tone that is on top of the whole thing. And even though I've sometimes seen both the book and the film described as not political, I would be interested to hear what your impressions are at the end of the film, uh, maybe out in the lobby. Because I think it is very deeply uh, political, but it is not propaganda. Uh, I am both a translator and an interpreter, um, and what's interesting in doing subtitles, which is relatively new to me, is it sort of brings the two things together. You know, um, to my editor friends, uh, and to my regret, we don't have an awful lot of punctuation, not an awful lot of pronouns. We try to get a big bang out of as few words as possible. With that, we can start our slideshow. Here you see Levy himself, who uh, in later pictures sort of looks a little bit like Harpo, Marks on steroids. Uh, uh, he was quite the womanizer, actually, which sort of led to some of his biggest problems. He had a ticket to go to the United States um, and instead couldn't, and you know, he, he ha would have had to leave from Lisbon, but he could not get a permit to cross uh, Spain um, and didn't want to take the risk and was also very drawn to a woman he was interested in in Florence. Uh, the next slide. Here you get a sort of broad picture of the region which is today called Basilicata Lucania in both the book and the film. Next. And here you'll see this train which goes to, let's see if I can see it properly. But when it's the title, Christ Stopped at Eboli, is because the train stopped at Eboli. And then from there on in, you had to take a bus. But when they said Christ, when they, they use the word Christian in the film and in a lot of early Italian works to indicate a human being in the full sense. Uh, there you see Matera, which has gone from being the very impoverished town that is described in the book and in history to being this year the European city of culture. And this hovel, which is described in the film, of this, these caves where people lived with their animals, is now a very fancy hotel. Next slide. Here you see, uh, in, the, in the film, in the book, it's called Galliano, but the real place is Agliano, and a tribute paid to Levy there. Next. Here you see some of the paintings. What's interesting in what Rosi does with the film is that he tells it very much from the point of view of Levy, and so he tries to capture Levy's own uh, approach and view of the landscapes through the way that it's filmed. Next. This I was particularly moved by because this was the cover of the Italian edition that I read so many years ago. Here you see one of the children. The next slide, please. 
one of the things that's often difficult to do in translation when you're dealing with something uh, so specifically Italian is trying to capture the context that's behind certain words. Here, I was sort of surprised to find myself dealing with the same problem as I dealt with in Senso, which is the historical background that explains a lot of things. When we say risorgimento, Italian unification, it is the background because you're talking about this sort of yoking together of northern and southern Italy, but under a northern Italian crown. Over a long period of time, really three wars, uh, but basically from 1860 all the way up until around 1890 when the, uh, Rome was finally taken. Next slide. You'll hear the word Piedmont. It's not just a region which is great for wine and for food, but here it is referring to the fact that the king of Italy and the maybe seen as a sort of foreign occupying power for the peasants was in the area of Piedmont. It was called the Kingdom of Sardinia, King Victor Emmanuel uh, II. But at this time, I can't remember the name of the king, but when you hear Piedmont referred to, it is with hostility, and it represents the sort of it is the national government of Italy, but which is actually the government of the north. Next slide. Bersaliere comes up. Now, you might have seen them in films. They sort of run around, and, they, and, and in films, they're often running very, very quickly, as they do in parades today, and they have what looks like a dead chicken on their heads. <laughs> but the Bersaglieri were the, were the soldiers of the northern royal army. So when you hear reference to a Bersaglieri or a Piedmontese being lost in the mountains, then they're talking about a foreigner and someone that was seen as a hostile soldier. Next. Instead, when you're looking at the south, you'll hear a lot of talk about the Borboni. That's very tricky to translate into English because it comes out as bourbon and you're all going to be thinking of whiskey. Um, but the bourbon kings, these Spanish kings of, of southern Italy, you had a kingdom down there. So they had a very different form of government. They had a different, very feudal relationship with their overlords. And, uh, you know, the northerners will be criticizing, especially at the end of the film, you'll hear them criticizing the southerners as being still somehow enthralled to, the, to Bourbon feudalism. And the two Sicilies, because they had both uh, Naples and that area and Sicily. Next. Brigandage. Uh, we sort of, I fought with uh, uh, Bruce a little bit over whether we could call them bandits or not. It was actually a specific movement. It was a kind of insurrection against the northern occupation of southern Italy. And part of it was organized and financed by the Bourbons, but part of it also just became its own kind of uh, anarchical and um, guerrilla type movement. So you'll hear a lot of mention of that word, but it isn't just an ordinary bandit. Some of it is a form of resistance to this northern occupation. Next. Il Duce, I don't think, needs an explanation or fascism, but this does take place in the midst of this sort of 20-year period, Il Ventenio, when uh, at this particular moment, the Duce is sort of aspiring to regain the glory that was ancient Rome by creating an empire in the next slide, please. Lindbergh sort of beat this Italian aviator, Francesco de Pineda, in doing the, de Pinedo, in doing the first uh, solo transatlantic crossing. He was a very significant figure and also a big moment in sort of nationalist uh, pride under fascism. Next, the Abyssinian War, which I was sort of indicating earlier. This is taking place in this very same period. Um, with this claim that this was going to, uh, again, restore the glory of Rome and to create opportunities for poor southern Italians by giving them land that they could work. And it is celebrated in, the next slide, this song that you'll hear, and I've translated certain snatches of it, Facetta Nera, the little black face of the Abyssinian girl, a sort of grossly uh, sexualized depiction of uh, this assault on Abyssinia, today's Ethiopia, where Italians were criticized, actually, the League of Nations, they used uh, mustard gas, they used poison gas to kill thousands of people, thousands of innocent civilians. Um, and it's m only mentioned en passant here, but I think it is something that really bears a kind of uh, magnification. So uh, I think that's it for our slides, yes? Uh, the other song that you'll hear is Jovinets, another one of the fascist themes. Um, finally, I would just say that when you're looking at this film, when you're looking at the central figure of Carlo Levi being played by Gian Maria Volonté, it's a strangely muted performance because I think the idea was in doing a literary adaptation, a sort of first person memoir, what Rosie wanted, to, wanted that central character be, to be was not someone that was acting but someone that was observing. We've taken a very minimal approach to the subtitles in this so that you will sort of enter into this world with him and be looking not at him but be looking through his eyes. Uh, with that, uh, enjoy the film.
Thank you for listening to Film Forum Presents. Special thanks to Rialto Pictures for making this event possible. If you like what you just heard, please be sure to subscribe to get future episodes and rate and review so that more movie lovers can find us. Film Forum is an independent nonprofit cinema, and our doors have been kept open for nearly 50 years thanks to the invaluable support of our members and donors. Please visit www.filmforum.org for details on membership as well as information and showtimes for our current programming. See you at the movies.